Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert joining you from Quito, Ecuador. 100 years ago, on November 2nd, 1917, Earl Arthur Balfour, Foreign Minister of the British Empire at the time, issued the following declaration. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done that which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in other, any other country. Those 67 words have become justification for the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish state, the state of Israel. Chaim Weizmann, who later became the first president of the state of Israel, made a great effort to convince the British government to support Jewish colonization of Palestine. Every year since, on November 2nd, Palestinians mark the declaration as a moment of loss. The Israeli government, on the other hand, celebrates the Balfour Declaration on the state as a moment of historical triumph. A recently released short film shows how progressive Jewish voices think about the Balfour Declaration today. Let's hear a short segment. At the same time as the Declaration promises individual human rights to all the people living there, to a certain extent, it also grants collective human rights, that is this idea of the national home, to one group at the expense of another. And in human rights, in addition to individual human rights, uh, there is also uh, a right to collective self-determination as part of the national group or identity or any other type of collective. And those were the rights that were denied the Palestinians at the moment in which the Balfour Declaration was made. Joining us to discuss the background and ongoing significance of the Balfour Declaration is Shir Hever. Shir is a Real News correspondent in Heidelberg, Germany. His new book, The Privatization of Israeli Security, was published by Pluto Press in uh, 2017. Welcome, Shir. Thanks for having me, Greg. So let's start with uh, what were the conditions back then in Palestine when the British government published the Balfour Declaration? Uh, in those years, the World War I was still raging, uh, and the British Empire was locked in uh, war with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, held uh, many territories in that region, including Palestine, for about 400 years. Um, and just a few months after the British uh, forces uh, took over the entirety of Palestine, uh, the Balfour Declaration was uh, issued. Now, the British forces um, were already starting to rely on uh, oil, on petrol. And uh, uh, the decision of the British Empire to take control over areas with oil wells uh, certainly uh, influenced the decisions uh, of which areas they wanted to conquer and in what way. Uh, for example, the conquest of Iraq uh, at that same time uh, was, was highly influenced by oil uh, concerns. And it's not surprising that shortly after the war, uh, the British Empire started building a massive oil factory, uh, oil refinery uh, in Palestine, in the city of Haifa, uh, to serve its uh, own interests. Now, this was towards the end of the war, 2017. So uh, there was already an ongoing uh, communist revolution in Russia. And there was concern that Russia may uh, step out of the war. Uh, it was allied with uh, Britain at the time. And uh, part of the reason that the Balfour Declaration was, uh, was declared is that uh, the British government believed that the communist revolution in Russia is somehow being uh, promoted by Jews or by Jewish forces. And this is part of the very uh, racist worldview that was prevalent at the time, that Jews somehow um, control a lot of world events. And so they thought that may making a pro-Zionist statement might actually help convince Russia to stay in the war. And uh, it should also be stated that uh, uh, at that moment, the um, United States was also starting to play a major role in the war, uh, First World War. Uh, so uh, that, that also played a role considering the Jewish uh, community within the United States and mainly how the British government interpreted uh, the role of that Jewish community. Uh, oh, and, so and I should also mention, of course, that uh, in Palestine, uh, there were uh, some Jews already living, about 70,000. Uh, many of them were not even Zionists, but uh, the vast majority of the population were Palestinians. We're talking about uh, Muslim Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, but also Jewish Palestinians, which the uh, British government just didn't recognize. They didn't consider them 
as, as a, um, a partner for, for uh, their political plans. So considering that there were only about 70,000 Jews in Palestine at the time, as you mentioned, and uh, most of them or many of them not even Zionists, and that there were about 700,000 Christian and Muslim Palestinians, why then did the British government decide to side with the Jews uh, at that moment? So yeah, this is, this is a very uh, important question. It's highly debated today among historians. Um, there's, for example, uh, uh, the idea that uh, Lord Balfour himself was an anti-Semite and wanted uh, to get rid of British Jews. And he thought that uh, establishing a, a national home for Jews in Palestine would somehow um, convince Jews to leave Britain. Uh, now, this particular interpretation was especially prominent uh, in the worldview of another uh, contemporary British minister, uh, contemporary to the time, Lord Samuel Montagu, who was minister of India, and he was himself Jewish. Uh, I'd like to, to read uh, the statement by Lord uh, Samuel Montagu regarding the Balfour Declaration. And he said, um, I assume that it means that Mohammedans and Christians are to make way for the Jews and that the Jews would be put in all positions of preference and should be peculiarly associated with Palestine in the same way that England is with English uh, or France with the French, that Turks and other Mohammedans in Palestine in Palestine will be regarded as foreigners, just in the same way as Jews will hereafter be treated as foreigners in every country but Palestine. Perhaps also citizenship must be granted only as a result of a religious test. This very cynical text, and I should of course clarify that uh, this text was, was written 100 years ago, so the word Mohammedan uh, is his way to say Muslims. Uh, but uh, this very cynical text uh, shows his concern that by promising a national home for Jews in Palestine, that would undermine the rights of European Jews. We have to remember the vast majority of Jews in 1917 lived in Europe, not in Arab countries and not in the United States, and certainly not in Palestine. They lived in Europe, and uh, Lord Montagu, as a, a European Jew, was concerned uh, about that. But nevertheless, the British government decided to, to side with the Jews, and there are several reasons for that. I already mentioned briefly uh, the oil concern and, and the uh, speculations that maybe siding with uh, the Zionists would uh, improve the chances of the British government in the First World War. Uh, Chaim Weizmann, uh, that uh, you mentioned, uh, is a, a scientist, was a scientist and, and helped to develop uh, technologies that also uh, assisted the British army during the war, and that was considered another point uh, in favor of the Zionist movement. Uh, but this is also a time when the colonialism uh, of uh, the world, uh, the colonial movement uh, by, by Europe, uh, European powers, was starting to lose its legitimacy. Uh, and in fact, the British Empire, and uh, this was uh, shortly after the Sykes-Picot agreement between France and Britain, they divided uh, the Middle East between these uh, great empires and we're already start, uh, uh, dividing how they're going to uh, take over the, the land that they are going to conquer from the Ottoman Empire. They couldn't just say, we want Palestine for ourselves. They had to somehow frame it within a sort of benevolent colonialism uh, framework to say, we're doing this in favor of the local people. And uh, at the time, it was... Um, framed in such a way that the, the native peoples of the Middle East are the Arabs, the Ar uh, uh, Armenians, and the Jews. Uh, now, in terms of demographic uh, demographics, that's nonsense. The Jews were mostly European people, much more than they were Middle Eastern people at the time. Um, so that was a, a clearly a, an attempt to reframe the Middle East in a, in a different way. But for the British Empire, that's, that was a very usual kind of policy. The British Empire always used uh, division uh, as, as a way to control territories, divide and conquer, and in the same way, they've also created divisions between India and Pakistan, Northern Cyprus and, and Southern Cyprus, uh, the United States and Canada, uh, New Zealand and Australia, and the list goes on. So what kind of legal importance did the declaration have back then, and what uh, legal importance does it have today? 
the, the language of the Balfour Declaration uh, is very poetic, but not very legalistic. The, the term national home is not defined. What, the, what does it mean, national home? Uh, Miri Weingarten, that uh, uh, we heard before, uh, she says that, uh, she, she interprets that as a collective rights, national rights for self-determination for Jews, which would be for the first time recognized as a nation and not just as a religion. Uh, but but this is an interpretation. This is actually not in the text. And you could also interpret a national home in a different way. What is also missing from the Balfour Declaration is borders. A national home in Palestine, what does that mean? A house, a town, a city, uh, that is also not clarified. Um, so in, in, a, in fact, it's, it's a colonial statement which is very vague, uh, and um, could be interpreted as a violation of the Sykes-Picot agreement. It could be interpreted as maybe just, just a gesture, but it was significant in the sense that for the first time, the local population of Palestine, the native population, the Palestinians, realized that this very small community of Jews, uh, uh, Jewish immigrants that are coming from Europe to Palestine are not just uh, immigrants uh, coming for economic reasons, uh, but they're actually a political threat to their own existence. Until 1917, Palestinians uh, had uh, mostly uh, uh, cordial relations with the Jewish immigrants. Uh, there were some, some uh, conflicts, but, uh, but those were relatively minor. Starting from 1917, uh, 1917 and the British intervention on behalf of this very small minority, Palestinians start to realize that uh, they might be replaced by this new population unless they fight it. And from that moment, you can say, uh, we have a conflict, we have a struggle. So that was important. But of course, today, uh, we, when we talk about uh, uh, documents that serve as justification for nation states, for borders, and, and so on, uh, colonial documents don't count for much. And uh, I don't think the United States, for example, justifies its uh, existence by the declaration of uh, King George III. You know, that, that sort of uh, colonial heritage is, is usually frowned upon, not, not something to be proud of. So it is very interesting that the Israeli government very unapologetically considers the Balfour Declaration such a founding statement. It's, it's an admittance, in a way, that by the Israeli government that they are a colonial project, that they are some kind of leftover from 19th century colonialism and early 20th century colonialism. And in fact, uh, a group of uh, Israeli jurists uh, have uh, uh, used the Balfour Declaration to justify the violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention to say, well, actually, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are not occupied territory because the Balfour Declaration uh, gives uh, the state of Israel some kind of rights in that territory. That legally, that's of course nonsense, but within the Israeli discourse, that's a very important um, issue. And, and loyalty to the Balfour Declaration is very important within the Israeli discourse to show patri patriotism and, and Zionism. And turning to the Palestinians, last year, President of Palestine, Mahmoud Abbas, spoke in the UN and demanded that Great Britain apologize for the Balfour Declaration. Let's listen to what he had to say. The notorious Balfour Declaration, the infamous De Balfour Declaration, by which Britain, Great Britain, gave without any right, authority or consent from anyone the land of Palestine to other people. This paved the way for the Nakba of Palestinian people, their dispossession, their displacement from their land. And as if this were not enough, the British mandate interpreted this declaration into policies and measures that uh, contributed to the perpetration of the most heinous crimes against a peaceful people in their own land. So in contemporary politics about Israel-Palestine, what is the role of the Balfour Declaration? Um, the role of the Balfour Declaration today is symbolic, but we should not uh, consider that to be uh, an understatement of how important it continues to be. Symbolic or not, 
it's a very important part of the Palestinian uh, discourse about liberation and of the Israeli discourse about repressing Palestinian desires for freedom. Uh, so because the Balfour Declaration in such a, it uses a language that takes the very small minority and grants it national rights and takes the very large majority and calls them the non-Jews of Palestine, uh, so completely erasing their identity. Uh, the Balfour Declaration continues to be a symbol for the Zionist movement today, and it is an important one. In fact, one Israeli politician who is himself a Palestinian, a member of the Labour Party, uh, said that he doesn't want to participate in, the, uh, in, in this 100-year celebration of the Balfour Declaration. He doesn't feel comfortable with that. So the head of his party, uh, Avi Gabay, uh, head of the Labour Party, said, well, next year he's not going to be part of our party anymore. And I think that really shows uh, the, the level of uh, repression of free speech and, and freedom of opinion in the name of this symbol of the Balfour Declaration. For Palestinians, the Balfour Declaration uh, is a constant reminder that the West, the uh, colonial powers, the imperial powers, and later also the United States, are clearly supporting the occupier and clearly supporting the state of Israel and not the rights of the indigenous people. Uh, and in fact, the graffiti artist uh, Banksy just did a sort of, organized a sort of party in Bethlehem uh, where uh, the British Empire apologizes for the Balfour Declaration. Of course, the Britain did not apologize, but by using actors, and one actor was dressed up as the Queen uh, of England, uh, they issued this uh, fake apology. And Banksy also created a, a graffiti artwork uh, to commemorate the 100 years of the Balfour Declaration. Okay, well, I was speaking to Shir Hever, Real News correspondent in Heidelberg, Germany, and author of The Privatization of Israeli Security. Thanks again, Shir, for having talked to, about, to us about this. Thank you very much, Wayne. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.